have a rather controversial subject this morning, and I believe that it has practical value at the present time when the world seems to be filled with anxieties. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that the mind is the slayer of the real. This concept was carried over into Buddhism very strongly. And the entire problem in Buddhist philosophy is founded upon the, ne the need for a complete reorganization of the relationship of the human being to his own mind. So in the light of that, we will begin a study which perhaps is not entirely orthodox Hinduism. I'm not sure that it's orthodox anything, but it's the way it looks at the moment, and we'll share it with you. Actually, the human mind creates most of the situations with which we are faced. Our civilization is a product of mind. Science, culture, art, music, literature, all these arise in the human mind. The mind is an incredible instrument, and we cannot for a moment uh, discount its contributions. But when we sum them all up, we realize that the mind has certain deficiencies that the mind is a useful servant. It is an accountant and a bookkeeper, a financial expert, all these things. But it is not able to guide its own course toward truth. Truth and mind have been at, point, at points of difference for a very long time. Mind leads to things as they are. And if we are willing to accept things as they are, as truth, then we may declare ourselves to be mentalists. But the question remains, are these things which are now so familiar to us actually true? This seems to be a point in which the Stoics and the Cynics would differ from the existentialists of today. Let us then ask ourselves, what is the principal predicament that faces us? Well, one of the very prime answers to that is difference of opinion. You can go up and down the world and you will find that each individual has certain opinions of his own. And he is far more concerned with sustaining these opinions than he is in the search for truth. Of course, this matter is passed over lightly because to each individual, his own opinion is the truth. But there's something wrong with the concept because if each person's um, opinion is the truth, the confusion is worse confounded. There is no possible way of organizing these innumerable differences in religion, philosophy, science, and all the arts, in history, geography, polit politics, all these things, differences of opinion are innumerable. All this points out another very interesting possibility. All these arise in the mind, and if the mind is continually breeding differences, forever, and is in conflict with its own particular productions, so that the mind of one fights the mind of another, then there is something that needs further consideration concerning the place of the mind in the history of the world. I think it is safe to say that at the present time, most of the present muddle is mental. Some persons, many are frightened to death, and fear in itself, anxieties arise in the mind. Other persons are quite certain that everything is being done badly. This is a conviction in their own minds, and is opposed to similar but opposite convictions 
in other minds. The mind also predicts the future, filling us all with further fear and discontent. Projecting our present thinking, we come to some very sad and doleful possibilities lying ahead. Also, the mind tells us what success is, what it requires, and how we should approach it. The mind strengthens ambitions and gives techniques for the advancement of personal ends. The mind also is a great salesman. It is a governor in its own right, and the mind under one body or another sits in every chair of government in the world. All things are governed by the mind through the minds of governors. So this mind gets to be a pretty important factor in existence, possibly the most important to an embodied world. Now, if there is any question as to the validity of the mind, then we should begin to give consideration to the mental equipment and how we are supposed to use it. One of the points that Marcus Aurelius makes in his meditations is that the most useful contribution mind can make is long-range planning. Whenever a person performs an action, no matter how simple, simple or complicated the single action may be, it must have a consequence. And the moment the action is performed, the consequence should be considered. Now, this is completely contrary to present policy. Today, we think in terms of do as we please now, and the devil take the hindermost. We make no long-range study of our problems, and we perform whatever action is convenient, comfortable, or pleasant at the moment, with no consideration of the place of this action in the common action of mankind. So Marcus Aurelius was quite correct when he pointed out that almost everything we do has consequences. And the individual performing an action should be sufficiently intelligent to consider the consequence even before he performs the action. And if the consequence of the action is obviously wrong, he will not perform that action. If this was applied to present world conditions, things would be practically solved because everything that we do is in terms of immediate profit or immediate satisfaction or immediate comfort. The consequences are given no consideration at all. The present uh, lack of basic environmental utilities is a proof of this. The problem of food is a pro proof of short-sightedness and indifference to consequences. Almost all ecological difficulties arise from immediate waste without thought. So everywhere the person is not using the mind as it should be used. He is allowing the mind to de devote itself largely to pleasing and fulfilling the ambitions of its owner. This was not the original use of mind. It was not created for this purpose. It was a guide, but it has become an employment by means of which we fulfill our appetites. Now, if we consider the matter in the terms, perhaps, of Oriental philosophy, we can say, then, that the mind, and this, I think, is an important point, that the mind itself can destroy only the products of itself. In other words, whatever the mind creates that is wrong, the mind itself can and will destroy. Any illusion that passes for truth will ultimately be exposed. 
Actually, the mind cannot, however, destroy the natural world. The human mind has no essential influence upon the infinite plan of things. It can only affect the little patterns that it sets itself. It can move a civilization into limbo because it put it there in the first place. It can change the destiny of the individual if he allows it to guide his conduct. And if his mind fails him or is wrong, the consequences are pernicious. The mind, however, cannot touch infinite law. So in the Orient, Chinese, Hindu, Buddhist, we find a certain concept that there is a reality. This reality may be regarded as infinite will. It is distributed throughout every atom of space. It is everywhere, in everything, always. And it is unchangeable. It cannot be altered, compromised, or exploited. Any effort to go against the divine will by the human mind must end in disaster. The mind was made to obey the laws which it learns. And one of the purposes of the mind is to help to educate us as to the universal divine plan of things. The mind is to show us how the infinite wants it done. Instead of that, we use it, in a sense, to take over the divine pattern and reform that which in itself is unchangeable. There is no evidence that the universal laws have ever changed in the slightest degree. They have become more apparent at some times than at others. They have been interpreted in innumerable ways by various cultures, usually by minds determined to adapt or apply universal energy to private purpose. But actually, the laws themselves never change. The infinite purpose cannot be disturbed by the action of human will or intention. If then we are really concerned with solving something, we must try to discover what the law of that thing is. And that law is not enacted or maintained or variously amended by the Supreme Court. That law is the will of the infinite for that which it has brought forth out of itself by the application of its own laws. So we live unlawfully in a lawful universe and somehow feel that we can succeed in living our own way regardless of its relationship to the infinite will. Again, Marcus Aurelius points out very definitely that the patterns by which we live, if analyzed carefully, are supremely stupid. <laughs> Practically everything that we do is foolish. Our motives are foolish. Our objectives are foolish. The whole pattern of our way of existing in our present way is to overlook and forget the law and emphasize the comforts. Each individual is surrounded by certain inevitable facts, and he tries to forget these to the best of his ability, but even though forgotten, by his conscious mind, they're in no way weakened, altered, or removed as patterns of power. Man is born, and man suffers, and man dies. And in the interval between birth and death, there are years, sometimes a few, sometimes many. In these years, certain experiences are possible to the human being. And one of the questions we must ask if we are thoughtful is, what did the infinite will 
determine that we should do with the finite years of our own living. If we live in this world 80 or 85 or 90 years, what were we put here to do? Now, we very carefully avoid this question in practice. We are not interested in what we were put here to do. We are interested in doing as we please as long as we can. We are not wise enough or long-range enough to take care of ourselves properly. And there are thousands, millions of people every day who are shortening their own lives by their own foolishness. But this has no basic effect upon their thinking. Also, many build these years of life into programs which finally make them unfit for creative thinking. They cannot think solutionally of anything except stocks, bonds, and real estate. The stocks, we know what their futures are, and we know also the bonds are just a cut better sometimes. And as far as real estate is concerned, we will ultimately inherit only the plot in which we are buried. All the rest goes to other purposes. And today, due to the expensive and scarcity of land, uh, cremation is taking over and our ashes will be dumped in the ocean. We can no longer afford even the ground for a grave. And yet we are talking constantly in million dollars worth of this, a billion dollars worth of that, and the importance of having an adequate munition with which to support and protect what we have. There are no munitions in the world that could be as protective as common sense. But we have not yet come to that degree in our thinking. Marcus Aurelius, at the end of the first chapter of his little meditation, says that fame is no more important than oblivion. Because if it is true that we depart from here, any reputation that we may leave behind has no value for us after we are gone. We may live magnificently as far as our own thinking is concerned, but if there is any reputation that will endure at all, it is not our estate but our conduct which will ultimately be honored. And it is the honoring of conduct that is one of the rarer things that we have. And because we are embarrassed and ashamed of our own conduct, we spend time now, year after year, tearing down the conducts of those whom we admired previously, simply to bring them down to our own level. Now, with this mind problem, what are we doing? How are we going to handle this problem of our own careers? If mind is not the ruler, then what is? Actually, the Buddhist opinion on this matter is rather, I think, simple. Namely, that to the degree that we relax the intellect and permit the internal part of ourselves to come through, to that degree, desirelessness leads to truth. Desire is forever between us and truth. In the cause of desire, we compromise truth every moment of our lives. And we make it a law, practically, to pervert realities in order to advance careers. And we penalize the individual who lives as he should. Now, this penalizing process is most discouraging. But it, at the same time, it is not an excuse for compromise. Compromising is a means of putting ourselves into those patterns which are destined to fail. Compromise makes us one with the grand mistake of mankind. 
It gives us no future. It promises nothing but ultimate disaster. So in the Oriental system, we come into a pattern in which the plan, Taoism, the plan, must be allowed to shine through. What we want is not important. What must be and should be is all important. And if it interferes with personal success, that personal success is best interfered with. We are working toward a realization of something. Now, in our daily living, in these complicated eras, we are slowly becoming aware that what we are doing is not working. We also know that it has been tried for 10,000 years and has never worked. And how a person can call themselves a thinker or a scientist or an executive and continue to make the same mistakes that all of his kind have made since the dawn of time is difficult to understand but it is part of this philosophy of immediacy. The future, so what? The, matter, the most important thing is now. We must have it today. We must finish it today. For somehow we realize that even tomorrow is uncertain. So in this particular phase of living, uh, we are now under a new threat. A few years ago, the, the atomic bomb was exploded for the first time. And for all intent and purposes, that explosion, or those explosions, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were the end of human complacency. From that time on, fear began to develop within the human being. He discovered that his ingenuity has enabled him to create a means of self-destruction that is more astonishing and more final than anything he ever knew before. It was bad enough when he threw rocks at his enemies. It was even worse when he used bows and arrows against his friends. But now, the imminent uh, development of a means of universal destruction has caused a great deal of fear. Now, fear is a negative emo emotion. It is something that in itself is comparatively worthless. Fear perhaps gives us some protection against ex the extreme foolishness, but in the ma as a means of solving our problems, it is of no importance. But fear is there. But fear is not leading us to correct the cause. Instead of our fear causing us to find some solution, fear is leading to the multiplication of nuclear armament to make sure that everybody has more than they know what to do with of the power to destroy themselves. Now this would be a very tragic thing except as the Orientalist suddenly realizes and has always believed, namely that anything that can be destroyed by the nuclear bomb will die anyway. This is something that we haven't taken into consideration. Namely, that the whole structure is locked within matter, material things, cities, towns, institutions, races, nations, political systems. All these things are physical, material things. Wealth is a physical thing. War is a physical thing. These are all part of a part of nature which we call material, physical, belonging to this world, part of the corporeal structure of life. Some years ago, when the, the atomic bomb 
was still in its uh, earliest stages, I knew a number of persons who built bomb shelters. They thought they were really long-range thinking. They never really studied the problem of the shelter they were building. Some fast salesman sold them the idea. But actually, the whole theory was comparatively worthless. It was another phase of mental escapism. Most of the persons whom I knew that built those bomb shelters to protect them against the fiery death from the sky, most of them are already dead, and they've died in their beds. <laughs> and the bomb shelters are now used for garden tools or for food storage or as a play play pen for children. The uh, fear had no effect upon uh, the life expectancy of those people. Perhaps they felt a little safer with the shelter, but it ha never had anything to do with it. Every day, many, many times as many persons die of natural causes as died in the original atomic explosions. We are killing more people today on the highways with the drunken drivers, uh, then it is at all likely we will lose in the next world war if there is one. The individual doesn't measure things. He doesn't think anything through. He doesn't realize the mayhem on the highways. He doesn't realize that while he is frightened to death of a nuclear bomb, he is perfectly willing to drive a high-powered car under the influence of alcohol. He doesn't fear to kill himself by drink, but the idea that it might happen from the bomb touches him to the very soul of his nature. Here again, we are in the face of the Oriental point of view. Anything that happens in the material world is subject to the function of man's mortal mind. The only way he can get away from his difficulties in this world is to properly educate his mind. And the only way he can educate his mind correctly is to train it to recognize that there is something in the universe more important than mind. Mind has to take a secondary relationship with life. While it is primary, we will be in trouble forever. Mind, therefore, in a sense, stands between each of us and the realities which could bring us security and happiness. Mind has set up a conspiracy. It has set up a vast organization of ulterior motives. It has turned us in from the very depths of speculation and monetary fantasy into the complete waste of time in front of a television set. These things indicate a mind gone to seed, or perhaps we should say a mind that never got even as far as a seed in the life of the average owner. So while we sit around desponding over things, we have within our cranium a small cell that seems to be continually selling us out, making life more meaningless, more dangerous, more destructive than ever before in history. And yet people, all in all, are good. People are kindly. They want to do the right thing. Most individuals will do anything that seems to be right as long as it doesn't consequently result in too much loss for himself. But good-hearted, in an emergency, they come forward like heroes. Someone in trouble, there is always someone there to help. We are ready to feed the suffering and the hungry, take care of the sick. Individually, the human beings are good but they are under a mental collective pattern 
that has been bestowed upon them by their ancestors and supported by their education, and apparently made necessary by competitive economic policies. And under these, the individual sells out his birthright. He completely fails to recognize that he has responsibilities for the use of his mental equipment. The Oriental, trying to figure out just how to handle this situation, has finally come to the conclusion that about the best thing to do is to detach oneself from the confusion of worldliness. But this doesn't really work too well either, because the, when we walk out of worldliness, we move into a mountain somewhere and build a cabin we fail to realize that we take the worldliness with us into that cabin because it is in ourselves. So we then begin to suffer various privations for principles. We deny ourselves common comforts and develop a whole negative system of mental frustrations which solve nothing either. The mind has just settled in on us like a real tyrant. It has become an obsessor of our lives and values. Also, it has dominated us very largely by stimulating fear. It, of course, also uh, attacks and undermines the other basic freedoms of human life, but fear makes it impossible for us to change our ways. Fear causes us to believe that change may be more painful than what we have. Fear is also exploited by those who wish us to remain as we are. And fear in our personal lives stands between us and the major decisions that would help us to solve our problems. We all need a mental overhaul. And uh, for a time it was hoped that psychology would give it to us. But psychology has not been dedicated to the solution of mental problems. It has rather become a kind of justification for mental attitudes that are wrong but generally accepted. We are still very much in the same condition. The mind continues to slay the realities of life. Now, is there any way out of this particular uh, situation? Yes, there probably is a way out. But it's a way out that appears to be forced upon us by an aggrieved providence. Look out into space, and we are now beginning to fill space with menace. Once we regarded space as a kind of dome, and over the top of it was heaven, with angels and the divine trinity and the sources of life. Today we are talking about black holes which swallow up cosmic systems. <laughs> and we have science fiction to support this, and we have some tremendous motion pictures to prove that the universe hates us heartily <laughs> and was hardly able to wait till it can eliminate us. Nearly all visitors from other planets are assumed to be dangerous, or if they are not dangerous, they are strange, mysterious-looking things that do not appear as though there would be much competition. Actually, we are afraid of space. We are afraid of everything. We have not discovered in our own hearts and minds that we are part of an indestructible expanse of life, that space from one end to the other is immeasurable. It is all suspended from powers inconceivable. It functions by laws immutable. This mysterious thing that we call space goes on through light years and light ages. It is filled with living things, and over these living things the human being has no power whatsoever. The only authority he has is attempting to take over the proprietorship of this little molehill which we call the earth. But even if he takes it over, what does it mean? 
It means that he is on a small island somewhere in the edge of an infinite ocean. Even if he should conquer the planet, what does he have? Nothing. And when he does finally conquer it, he has a few years and then he must lie down and be conquered by the very earth he has taken over. The whole thing is completely beyond his control. He cannot change the infinite way. He cannot alter the great motions of the thousands and millions of suns and their planets way out yonder. He cannot even count the stars in the Milky Way. Every time he has a new telescope, he finds more stars. They go on and on and on. Hypothetically and scientifically, we say we have conquered space when we put a small uh, projectile out there a few miles and feel that we have actually outwitted the ages. Nothing has changed. We are still exactly what we were. Our link with reality is our only value. It is the fact that somewhere lurking is in ourselves is that unit of power which sustains all things. This is our wealth. This is our treasure. This is the reason for our existence and the means of that existence. We can never conquer anything except our own ignorance. And we can only conquer that when we use the whole creation as a vast symbol of an infinite power which we must obey. We cannot take over. We do not even know the morality of space. We do not know what is good and what is bad way out there. We measure all things in terms of our own comforts and discomforts. We do not know whether those planets that disappear and those stars that fade away actually die or whether, like the human being, they pass out of a body to be born again. We can find no death in space. We are not at all sure we can even find it here. But what we call death is a change of worlds, but is it a change of condition? We do not know. We have dropped a body, but this does not mean that we have died. So with all the uncertainties and all the fears of them, with millions of people fearing life and hundreds of millions fearing death, what have we accomplished? We are fools as we were before, as Faust says. We have not understood or given our attention to the final solution of things. Now, the final solution of things is also a matter of acceptances. When a person follows a wrong pattern for enough years, a good pattern will hurt him or make him feel uncomfortable. He will not want to change, even though he realizes that his present course is fatal. He does not want to understand life, even though he knows that he must sometime face a change. He is just beginning to think seriously about life after death, and he is not yet able to create a philosophical insight or a mystical insight strong enough to comfort him in the years as they come to an end. All of this is part of a little plan, a little pattern which we have to live by within the great pattern. And our only great hope or ability to handle this situation is through the complete reorganization of the processes of the mind. We've got to do something to get the tyranny of the mind off of our backs for it rides us as the old man of the sea in the story of Sindad the sailor. Now in this problem also, we have another factor. What is this mysterious energy that is released for the bomb? Years ago we had here on the Los Angeles Times a science commentator who wrote a daily column. I think his name was Lal, and he was a Hindu. But he wrote for many years. 
And I remember that in one of his columns, he discussed the fact that it appears that the ancient Hindus knew about the atomic bomb. Uh, he said, for example, and I suppose anyone who wants to can check it, that in the Ramayana, which is one of the great classics of India, it's a sort of a, like the Odyssey and the Iliad of the Greeks, a magnificent epic poem, that in the Ramayana, Sita, the wife of the avatar Rama, is kidnapped and taken to the island of Lanka, Ceylon, which has now become Lanka again, uh, by an evil king known as Ravana. And uh, Rama gathered a great army and in, uh, gained the assistance of the king of the apes. And all together they built a bridge and invaded Lanka and rescued Sita. But the point that is interesting is that it is said in the book that Ravan, the evil king of Lanka, became so angry when he realized that his cause had failed, that he shouted and screamed and tore and went about with such terrific combustion that to use the statement in the book, it was as though an atom had been split. Now, uh, whether this is understood correctly or not, we don't know, but it is an interesting thought that when you get very angry, go into hysteria, maybe some kind of an atom is getting split. There is an irrational release of energy. There is a tremendous power breaking through that is going nowhere. A great temper fit is a tremendous tempest. Perhaps it is an atomic bomb to the physical body. And if it gets far enough out socially, it can be a bomb disrupting society. A false, negative, destructive release of energy from within ourselves can be fatal, not only to our own lives, but to perhaps the whole society to which we belong. Therefore, the problem, first of all, to follow the Buddhist concept, would be that the individual has no reason to fear the bomb or fear any of the types of emergency that result from Ravan becoming angry. Actually, there is no essential difference emergency that result from Ravan becoming angry. Actually, there is no essential difference. All things that exist will be dissipated. Each living thing, without a bomb, will depart in its proper time. And according to the Buddhist concept of life, these departures are simply not important. It is not important to live long or to die young. It is important to gain growth, to unfold the inner potentials of life and to make proper use of energy allotment for an embodiment. And when that embodiment is finished, it, the, in, the information, the soul power that has been gained is built into a permanent being, and there it remains to contribute to the ultimate perfection of all that lives. Therefore, regardless of anything, if human beings wish to destroy themselves, they cannot even succeed in that because the only thing they can destroy is the physical body and they're going to lose that anyway. Now, it may be an uncomfortable way of losing it. It may be a, di a difficult and dangerous way. But so it is a difficult and dangerous way when a plane comes down. It is a dangerous and difficult way when a great explosion causes a building to collapse. It is a long and difficult way when some wasting ailment remains and uh, slowly destroying life. All these things are difficult, but the essential principle of all life is growth, to learn, to know, to do, to be, and to develop internal resource. 
And the less we think about our own immortality, the more the fact of its necessity will be forced on us. We will be made to face these things simply because we have refused to consider them constructively when we were in good health. When the world was at peace, temporarily at least, we did not have sense enough to protect the peace. When the individual had a moment of rest from pressures, he didn't have the sense to rest. He kept on wasting energy, time, and life, and it finally catches up with him. Civilizations waste the opportunity to grow. Great cultural systems fade away because they are not sustained by the people who need them most. So nature continues its own quiet course. And this little planet on which we live will continue. Man will not destroy his planet. But he will finally learn that it is absolutely necessary to live here according to universal law and not according to personal whimsy. It will be necessary for him to gain a certain insight and realize that he is a servant of a power that he must obey. Within a certain range, he has the power of individual choice. He can choose to, to do certain things. He has ample opportunity for constructive pleasures. He can accomplish many wonderful, wonderful things within the pattern of law, but it must be in a lawful pattern. In the story of Buddha, perhaps one of the most interesting and important uh, incidents, of course, is the Great Enlightenment. The illumination of Buddha under the bow tree is it described in the sacred scriptures as an almost inconceivable vision. But nearly all great religions have such visions in connection with their great spiritual leaders. With Buddha, the earth opened. Beings arose from the deep. From the sky descend, descended hordes of divine beings from the ten regions of space. Every type of thing was revealed in an enormous burst of light. And in the midst of it, the aspirant, the ascetic Gautama, remained quietly at peace, surrounded by a bedlam, a tremendous explosion that shook the earth to its foundations. For it was said that fountains in cities a thousand miles away reversed their courses. The oceans retreated, the rivers ceased to flow, the mountains trembled and fell. And in all, it sounds very much as though the bomb had been set off. Is it possible, and here I can't really speak for Buddha, and he might not agree with me, it's always possible, but does this story tell us of what you might call a nuclear fission on the positive side of life. Is there a tremendous potential of divinity locked in things? Can the, can the fission or nuclear action result in a release of a complete cosmic power, a power that can be beneficial? If this power is released uh, through the ascetic, through the mystic, through a mystical experience, it then and, that, and then that way only means that the cell of consciousness within each of us has split. And out of that comes cosmic consciousness. Out of that comes the one great experience of illumination. Is illumination the sole uh, fission within the human being himself. Can it also occur to a world in misery and pain? Is it the final release of the over-self? Is what we could call a mystical experience carried to an extraordinary degree result in the sudden distribution, diversification of the individual? or as we find in the book of the great deceased of Buddhism, 
where Buddha declares that he will not return again as a person, but will return again in every living thing. This could be the result of a self absolutely abstracted, turned into a, an immeasurable number of vital factors which take up their abode in everything that lives. Is this not po the possible explanation also of the statement of Paul, Christ in you, the hope of glory? Is this Christ in you, or the Buddha in us, or you? Actually, the infinite diffusion of consciousness. Is it possibly the actual vision of the cosmic cell at the root of our own individual existence? If so, then it can become and should be the most powerful religious experience of which the human being is capable. It may result in the complete dissolution of the personality. In fact, it is well known, possible, in the Oriental systems that the personality is gradually disseminated throughout all living things. Is it possible that evolution is the gradual fission of a cell of consciousness within each evolving creature? Does each creature have locked within itself the infinite power of the complete existence in the universe? Are we bound to the universe by a cell in ourselves that can expand and become even more wonderful and remarkable than any nuclear fission we can imagine? but a great fission in the term of constructive spiritual integrity, that suddenly the individual's consciousness becomes diffused through all living creatures everywhere, that this is the final renunciation, this is the fulfillment of the ultimate Buddha obligation, namely, that the power of enlightenment shall pass from the individual to become part of the consciousness of everything that lives. This is a thought that in passing might be a rather intriguing one. We know the mystical experiences are recorded and mentioned in a great many books, in a great many uh, different systems of religion. We know that uh, we have evidence that at a certain point in the life of the individual under discipline, there comes a power or ability to transcend the factor of self. Is it therefore the factor of self that stands between each of us and our own universality? Is it the factor of self by which we lock ourselves into the personalities which we know? And is there any ultimate salvation for the self set centeredness within us. What is this self? Buddha says it is an aggregate. It is the result of the sensory perceptions and the mental coordinator. The self is therefore not a being, but a focal point, and that this focal point stands in deadly interval between us and our real inner realities. That this uh, focal point has become what we like to call the ego and it is the basis of the egoism or egotism in ourselves. It is this focal point which enables us to sense ourselves as separate beings, that we are divided one from the other, that each one has this selfness in it. And this selfness is, of course, the aggregate of experience over many lives built into a pattern which we might call an individuality by which we separate ourselves from all other individuals. As long as this separateness continues, is our divine nature able to manifest itself. Life is universal. Form is particular. That we should live in a body makes us a separate being. If we transcend that body, either through consciousness or through evolution, then we are moving toward union. 
All evolution is the binding up of the wounds of separateness. All evolution is our own life expanding more and more and including more and more of the life around us. Sometime each individual must include every living thing within the area and order of his own insights. Sometime we will know how other creatures feel and we will know how other people think. We will experience it, not through the strange insecurity of words and things of this nature, but because the gradual unfoldment, expansion of the inner life, which is a kind of gradual nuclear fission, will come finally to carry light to the furthest parts of existence, and with that light our own comprehending power the power of the individual to escape from the, from the isolation of selfness into the greater union of common insights and common understanding. It is only when this insight increases and expands that we can possibly hope to solve the political problems of society. We cannot solve our problems by trying to convert each other. We have to solve our problems ultimately by releasing light from within, a light which shining as a mysterious spiritual kind of light uh, permits us to share the inner life of other people. We must have a light from ourselves that can shine into them and see them inwardly as we now see them outwardly. And as we see them qualitatively by the light of consciousness. We will then understand their motives, understand their peculiarities and their problems, and will find the necessary charity to build a better world. Now the question always is being asked now by physicists and people in these fields, how worlds are born. They think they see stars coming into existence, great bursts of light in space. Do planets and stars come into existence as a result of uh, division, a nuclear fission, in which a tiny cell, less than a mustard seed, suddenly releases within it a power greater than the human being can comprehend? Can we face this? Can we realize, as we do now, the incredible energy, the incredible power, the unbelievable life, locked within a single cell. Can we see this and sense it and not realize that in some mysterious way we are cells and that this same kind of life is locked within us, that in some way in the depth of ourselves is the power uh, to shake the world to its foundation, a power to expand our own inward life until we too become universal. The question has always been, where does evolution go? It would appear that evolution would go towards the constant unfolding of the power of this nuclear cell within ourselves, which is the divine power. As far as we know, uh, nuclear fission has come the closest of anything that we have experienced to the realization of the infinite power at the source of existence a power that is not only a, a tremendous physical energy, but we are going to learn ultimately that this power has also a great moral code. The nuclear fission experiment involves a release not only of power, but of laws. Laws, rules, and patterns that we did not know before will come into force. Everything we discover we must either use or abuse. If we use it well, it advances us. If we abuse it, it destroys us. And the same will be true in nuclear fission. If we use this power, it can advance our destinies immeasurably. If we abuse it, it can whip back at us with a tremendous reaction, a reaction which is only uh, an, an aspect of karma because we deserve it. Here we have gone along for thousands of years failing almost completely to experience the mysteries of our own birthright. 
We have gone along year after year, generation after generation, nation and race after one after another, without actually getting down to the great facts of life. Some have felt that these facts cannot be known, uh, but it's the truth of the matter is that we have not tried to find them. We have used one little tiny bit of energy in the search for truth and all the rest of our energy in the search for profit. And this problem has locked us within a situation which is contrary to God's will and natural law. We know that nearly all sickness in life is due to obstruction. Nearly everything that moves and has its proper circulation functions normally. Where obstruction leads to congestion and death. We have for ages uh, obstructed the flow of life. We have failed to use the potential that we have for the good of ourselves and others. We have settled down to uh, the assumption that life in us is simply an energy by which we can create physical things. It is the power to hit the nail with the hammer, and that's all. We have never realized that the skills that we have and the intricate nervous structure that we possess that all these different powers and others unknown and unconsidered at the moment, all of these point to the fact that there is a potential in man that is inconceivable. There is a potential that nothing has as yet really attempted to understand. Even our theologies have not gone far enough to teach us these mysteries. We do not know what to do with the life we have and we therefore waste it. Religion and philosophy can help us, but they cannot compensate for the fact that we do not apply in daily living the rules and principles that would make life unfold. In other words, the cell in us, whatever it may be, grows and is willing to grow and can grow and takes advantage of every step forward. And the more we become thoughtful, careful, wise, and gentle people, the more this inner life expands until finally this ultimate expansion is the great mysterious illumination seen in the Buddhist patterns and mandalas. It is the gradual expansion of an inconceivable light within ourselves, a light that we all possess, a light that is also our life, for without it we could not live. And because we are alive, and because everything in the universe is alive, this tremendous power can be released. And the power that is released in an atom is only symbolical of the power that can be released in the human heart, in the human soul. And not only is it something that uh, starts so small you can't even see it, but goes to become a great tree. So in man himself, while the beginnings of this process may be invisible, the greater part of it shines through the magnetic fields of the body, and in the course of ages, the individual becomes a great luminous center in this galaxy of ours uh, with which we are so deeply concerned today. If, as the result of our being faced as we are now, with this decision, with armament on everybody's mind, with the, the money we need to live being used to mean to make forms of destruction. As this goes on and on, and we try to figure how security can be achieved by mutual destruction, it must come to our realization that there has to be a better way. We are not going to disobey the laws of nature. And if from outside somewhere in space our planet is suddenly seen to have a little red spot on it somewhere, it means we have set off another bomb. But we will not destroy the planet. We cannot destroy anything that lives. We cannot destroy life by physical means, even though that means being nuclear fission. The only thing we can do with it is to cast that life out of body. 
We can destroy its bodies. We can destroy its cities. We can destroy its industries and its arts and its sciences. But we cannot destroy the life that is within any living thing. Even the sparrow cannot die. But it can become unembodied. And if they're through nuclear warfare, it becomes true that many people will be forced out of this life. Not one of them is dead. There is no death. There is only a change of worlds. We are all faced constantly with the challenge of this change. We are all faced constantly with the realization that all kinds of sorrows and mysteries hang over us, any one of which can take us away without much attention or notice. But we are not too much afraid of this because we believe in something. We believe in a life beyond, a life that is greater. We must face our problems of nuclear fission in exactly the same way. We know that while some may be sacrificed if the process continues, that nothing will die. The planet will not be destroyed. There will not be an extermination of the human race. There will be a destruction due to the fact the individual has deserved it from a complete failure to maintain the ethics which would have made this situation impossible. If the individual had lived by the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, if he had listened to the Sermon on the Mount and practiced these things, if he had been the type of human being that man is ideally conceived as being, we would never have this problem. We have this problem because everybody has done as they pleased and they have not been pleased with what they have done. They keep on adding to their wealth and impoverishing themselves. They keep on trying politically to solve problems that can only be solved by integrities. And even as they go along, they find it difficult to find proper candidates for office who might be a little more honorable than they are. If the candidate is more honorable, they are afraid of him. If he is less honorable, they are afraid of him. Fear continues. All because in this great structure of human existence, we have simply failed to be human beings. We have simply become organized units of self-centeredness. And we are suffering as a result. Now, how far that suffering is going to go will depend largely upon ourselves. But there is also something else that we can, I think, believe, and uh, Buddhism supports it, that karma does not fall unfairly. Karma does not de destroy that which does not deserve it. Karma does not injure the virtuous. Now, there are two explanations for this. One uh, which we would like to believe, and another which we might not like so well, but which is uh, equally honest. We can say that virtuous are not damaged by karma for the reason that understanding karma and understanding themselves they realize that the karmic reaction is just, that it is part of a process of learning, that unless the Lord chasteneth us, we continue to make us mistakes forever. So that we can say the innocent are not punished in the sense of the person who is bewildered, frightened, and believes that everything is unfair. On the other side of the problem, there is the, that the individual who does not deserve a certain type of karma, according to all of the Oriental philosophies and according to Christianity, the individual who does not deserve punishment will not be punished. And though there may be a great uh, separation of the wheat and the chaff, that the virtuous person will stand, that heaven will reward those who deserve it. There is no malice in anything. Even in a great disaster, there is no malice. There is no hatred. The universe has not turned against us. All these things are part of a process of growing up. We start as small children, and uh, like small children, 
we first of all are completely dependent upon our parents. Uh, therefore, we regard these parents as divine. They are heaven sent. Then slowly as we get a little older, we begin to have minds of our own. And we begin to experience the emotions of egoism with which all human beings are afflicted at some time. We begin to find ways of escaping uh, the rules of our parents. We try everything you can think of, including temper fits, to get our own way when we don't deserve it. These temper fits in society are wars, outbreaks, and common disasters. As we get a little older, we become more and more responsible for our own actions. We pass through educational processes in which as nations and peoples we see the consequences of our own conduct. And finally we enter maturity. In so-called maturity we are supposed to be able to rule and govern our own conduct properly. We become responsible for our own actions. Uh, where maturity is not simply the right to go to X movies. Maturity is the right to live and to think on the level of integrities. But many persons do not take this. Uh, young people growing up become more and more ambition bound. They become su su uh, servants of their appetites and emotions. They start in going into responsibilities they are not prepared for. They try to raise families without the consciousness and dedication and sense of responsibility necessary to proper parenthood. So all the way along, these individuals are not growing as they should. Nothing is helping them to grow, really. The parents are not able to handle the situation. The religious groups are no longer sufficiently authoritative. Education has failed utterly. And for most purposes, the professions and higher forms of intellectualism are a complete dead loss. Nothing has been done to help these young people to, to expand the divine quotient in themselves. They are not releasing the values that they have. They are blocking that release. And gradually this blocking takes over until they lose the power to release these powers. And as a result, drift through life to the end, and usually end dissatisfied, frustrated, and frightened. Now, human beings were built for some better destiny than this. There is a reason for us, and it would seem that the real reason is that we must attain our own integrity in life. Somewhere in the future, in front of us, are responsibilities, opportunities, privileges, and cosmic relationships far beyond anything we can even imagine at the present time. We are going somewhere. And we must try to prepare for that journey. Now, if we are going somewhere, we come back to Marcus Aurelius. For according to Marcus Aurelius, when we start a journey, we must decide where we are going. We cannot simply drift along and hope that the tides of some cosmic ocean will bring us to shore. The moment we begin to live, we must begin to plan the reason for our own existence. And we have to follow two levels of thought. We have to prepare for our material existence here. And that should take the lesser part of our, of our consciousness instead of the greater part. It is simply that we live here quietly and, and economically and simply within the providences of our opportunities and privileges. And if we lived moderately and economically and thoughtfully, there would be enough to feed twice our present population till the end of time. But instead of that, we go off on all kinds of tangents, waste natural resources, think of nothing but our own satisfactions and comforts, and have no plan whatsoever for the future. Internally, the higher aspect of our planning should be that we are planning a dedication. We should be deciding within ourselves the realm of service in which we hope to contribute to the good of all humanity. We hope sometime to be faithful servants in the house of the Lord. We hope that someday 
in the due course of time we shall come to a spiritual maturity in which having de dedicated ourselves to those values which are real and eternal we will gradually transmute all our potential into a potency for service for life for fulfillment for growth and for understanding in other words in a sense we shall become as God knowing good and evil we shall be dedicated to the service of the great plan which has produced us we are not the result of physical or biological accidents we are part of a cosmic purpose we are born in this world to do certain things to grow to gain to understand we are here to temper our uh, unconquered and undisciplined attitudes we are here to make friendships and overcome antagonisms we are here to be constructive factors in the social world to which we belong and like the Hindu we are here in order to pay the debt that we owe the parents who brought us here and we pay the, that debt by bringing our children into the world and trying to give them every opportunity to understand the truths of life which are the most important things in the world we have a very simple way of life but it can be extremely enjoyable there is no discussion of penances or great tribulations or stupendous sacrifices rather there is a simple statement that happiness is keeping truth keeping trust with that great mound of cosmic energy that lies at the root of existence this tremendous blazing star of the infinite this is the thing that we must keep faith with for as we do so we come more and more into the experience not only of the divine wisdom and the divine strength but also the infinite love which governs and rules all of these procedures in life we suddenly discover that this universe is also a kind of nuclear cell on the level of affection for the time comes when suddenly the personal love that we have in this world expands into a love of all that lives again a cell is split a great release of energy makes it possible for us to gradually become aware of the infinite tenderness and mercy of life itself everything that we seek is gradually unfolded for us if we will live according to the rules of the game and it is quite uh, conceivable to me at least that the infinite that we are seeking lies locked within ourselves and that a fission take, taking place results in a gradual release of a tremendous force that there is more force locked within each of us than was taken to build the planet that each of us is a tremendous center and if one little nuclear structure in nature can produce the atomic bomb or nuclear bomb then certainly the consciousness cell in ourselves is limitless it goes on and on and on there is no end to its growth there is no end to the mechanisms that it can motivate there is no end to the sensory perceptions unknown to us today which can be sustained and carried and energized by this unit of complete divine force within ourselves I know that words with this type of thing are extremely difficult we can't say anything the way we would like to because the words just do not seem to be available but perhaps something of the thought can be carried over namely that each of us has locked within him an infinite potential for good an infinite power to grow and an infinite ability to become a completely cosmic creative power so that if the time should come perhaps one day or another we shall be transformed into suns and in then we shall have planets around us then we will be transformed into stars and become part of the great hierarchies of existence and on and on and on until at last we become one completely one with the great illuminator the tremendous power that is the source of all things 
And that union is not going to be a dissolution. It is not going to be the person drowned in the infinite. It rather will be a person rescued from drowning in himself and given the power and skill and energy and understanding and insight to be part of the great hierarchy of powers that populates the firmament, that goes on and on forever. Man goes on and on forever, becoming a little wiser all the time. And if he takes the adversities that he faces in the proper way and grows from them, he will find this tremendous release from within himself, leading him on to the end for which he was appointed. Just what that end is going to be, we do not know, for it rests forever in the infinite itself. But we know that it is the greatest good, and we know that this end is also the perfection of wisdom and the perfection of love transcending anything that we can know in this world. Well, I guess that's it.